Welcome back. Chapter 22, The Galley Slaves episode, is fiercely debated by critics. It's easy to see why. For starters, the justice of the 16th century will inevitably seem exaggerated and cruel to modern readers. But does Cervantes share our values? Moreover, the fact that the mad Hidalgo releases the king's prisoners tempts us to consider that Cervantes used the episode to criticize political authority. But could he possibly have been anti-monarchical? What about law and order? Much like Don Quixote's Golden Age speech in Chapter 11, the Galley Slaves episode can seem subversive and conservative at the same time. I will admit that through the years, I have changed my mind several times regarding how to interpret this episode. As Cervantes would say, you, idle reader, can decide for yourself. So another fundamental episode begins with an allusion to Cide Amete Berengeli. This time, the second narrator calls him Arabic and Manchegan author. Consider how complicated this is. How can one be both Arabic and Manchegan? This might simply be absurd comedy, but remember that in the early 17th century, Spain is about to finally expel the last remnants of its Moorish population, and quite a few Moriscos populated La Mancha. So the intercultural irony of an Arabic and Manchegan author does not allow us to separate the question of King Philip III's justice toward common criminals from his justice toward a besieged group of people in one of the first modern cases of ethnic cleansing. Let's attend to the details of the episode. When the heroes see 12 men strung together like beads by their necks on a great iron chain and all in handcuffs, Sancho does not hesitate to say what they are. This is a chain of galley slaves, people forced by the king on their way to the galleys. Now, being sentenced to the galleys was harsh punishment, practically equivalent to the death penalty, because besides the fact that most of the slaves could not swim and wore heavy chains to boot, they had no way to defend themselves. In addition, since rowing was the way to steer and propel warships, the slaves were the main target of enemy fire. It should be emphasized that Don Quixote's reaction to Sancho's comment cuts directly to the political power of the king. What do you mean by forced people? Is it possible? that the king uses force against anyone? It's hard not to hear in this comment a critique of the Habsburgs, who used the judicial system of Castile to get the money and soldiers necessary to conduct their foreign wars. Also, according to the traditional laws of the various kingdoms of Spain, the monarch's powers were very limited. Don Quixote's stance figuratively indicts the king for abuse of power. Here it is proper to exercise my office, to right wrongs, and to aid and assist the wretched. After this brief exposition on royal power and the galleys to which the prisoners are destined, Don Quixote interrogates each one regarding the cause of his misfortune. What is striking at first is the contrast between the relatively slight crimes these men have committed and the harshness of their torture and their sentences. Cervantes highlights this contrast with charged puns and misunderstandings during their interview with Don Quixote. For example, the first prisoner says he is going to the galleys for love. And Don Quixote replies, well, if men are sent to the galleys for being lovers, I should have been rowing in them a long time ago. The prisoner clarifies that he fell in love figuratively, having been enamored of a laundry basket crammed with white linen. For this theft, he was sentenced to 100 lashes and three years in the galleys. Similarly, the second prisoner is guilty of being a musician and singer, and Don Quixote is confused again. It turns out he is a cattle thief, and to sing, cantar, means that he confessed under torture. The third prisoner says he's going for five years to the galleys for not having 10 ducats. Don Quixote again does not follow and offers 20 very willingly to deliver you from this sad burden. Here Cervantes gives us a short lesson on the marginal utility of goods. The prisoner's response indicates that money is only worth something in a context in which it is useful. That seems to me like having money in the middle of the gulf while starving to death because there is nowhere to buy what is necessary. 
He adds that with the money, he could have avoided his current situation because the judicial system is corrupt. If once upon a time I had those 20 ducats that your worship now offers me, I could have used them to grease the scribe's pen and fuel the ingenuity of my attorney, such that today you would see me in the middle of the Plaza de Zocodover of Toledo instead of on this road. We never discover the crime of this third prisoner. Thus, there is considerable irony in the first three cases due to the fact that Don Quixote himself has committed equally serious offenses. Twice he has not paid innkeepers, he has killed seven innocent sheep, and he just stole a basin from a barber. Now we hear the saddest case of all. A man of venerable features with a white beard that reached below his chest, hearing himself asked the reason for his presence, he began to weep and would not say a word. Another prisoner explains to Don Quixote that the old man goes to the galleys for being a go-between, or as we say in Spanish, an alcahuete, a facilitator of sexual encounters. He also gives indications of being a sorcerer. Recalling the essential role of the lady-in-waiting in Don Quixote's nightly narrative of the previous chapter, it's easy to understand why Aridalgo now vociferously defends the role of the go-between. He says that the old man should not go to the galleys, but rather should be made to direct them as their admiral, because the office of a go-between is not just any profession, but rather an office for the discreet and one that is vital for maintaining a well-ordered republic. Furthermore, Don Quixote, who gradually assumes the role of judge, says that seeing this venerable man in such distress for being a go-between makes him pardon the additional charge of being a sorcerer. And he even argues in a quasi-scientific way that no magic in the world can move and force our will as some simpletons believe, for our will is free and no herb or conjuring can force it. Notice the predominance of the verb to force the same one with which the chapter began. Does the power of the king derive from a kind of superstition? At the end of Don Quixote's long speech defending go-betweens, Sancho is so moved that he took out a four real coin from inside his shirt and gave it as alms to the poor old man. The appearance and movement of money in Don Quixote are radically important. I wager Cervantes is telling us that he respects the profession in question. The next prisoner Don Quixote addresses recalls for us the pre-Freudian themes found throughout Cervantes' texts. The prisoner has had sex with his cousins and then with two other women who are sisters, making his family relations grow so labyrinthical that the devil himself cannot figure them out. Interestingly, this seems to be the most educated man of the group. He wore the gown of a student, and one of the guards said he was a tremendous talker and very subtle with Latin.